We live in a wonderful time for medicine. If you need any proof, just think of all the suffering and death wrought by afflictions that are easily treatable today. But at what cost? Looking back on the road of medical progress, you'll find many parts littered with examples of ethics violations, human rights abuses, and, well, downright evil deeds. We do not arrive at today's medical knowledge without blood on our hands. It's easy to look back and condemn practices that fail our modern standards or debate over what the acceptable cost of advancement is. Do the ends justify the means? Should you risk one life for the sake of hundreds or thousands of millions? Scholars have had a heyday arguing over such questions, but what events caused the necessity of such contentious debates? Well, stay tuned, because you're about to find out. But just before we get started today, an appropriate word of warning. Look, many of the following experiments deal with subject matter that might be hard to deal with, so if you're not comfortable with that, don't feel bad. You don't have to watch. So let's start with one of the most infamous ethical breaches in US medical history. Starting in the 1930s, for 40 years, medical professionals tracked 399 infected with syphilis and 201 healthy black males in Tuskegee, Alabama, to document the progression of the disease. Though the men involved were given free medical exams, free meals, and burial insurance, they were only informed they were being treated for bad blood, a common term used in the region at the time to refer to several diseases. When the study started, syphilis was an untreatable STD. However, when penicillin became the widely available treatment of choice for syphilis in 1943, the researchers withheld the treatment so they could continue to document the natural progression of the disease. The experiment lasted until 1972, when the Associated Press finally broke the story. The public outcry caused the government to shut the project immediately and provide medical treatment and coverage for the subjects. The class action lawsuit was filed on behalf of the men and their families, resulting in a $10 million out-of-court settlement. In 1997, Bill Clinton issued a formal presidential apology for the study. Similar to the previously mentioned Tuskegee study, researchers from a U.S.-Guatemalan government partnership wanted to understand the effects of syphilis. However, in this study, instead of tracking people previously infected with the disease, the researchers purposefully infected nearly 1,500 men, women, and children in Guatemala with not only syphilis but a wide range of STDs, including gonorrhea and cancroid. The experiment's purpose oh, was to test the effectiveness of different treatments on different STDs. Thousands of people in vulnerable situations prisoners, psychiatric patients, soldiers, and sex workers were dosed with different STDs and experimented on. Some of the test subjects were as young as one year old. Though the experiment was ended in the 1950s, it did not become common knowledge in the United States medical community until the early 2000s. It wasn't until President Obama heard of the experiment in 2010 that the US government issued a formal apology. It is a commonly held belief that those put in prison lose their rights. By committing a crime against society, you lose the privileges that society can offer. But for 20 years, from the 1950s to the 1970s, experiments carried out in Pennsylvania's Holmesburg prison pushed the boundaries of what is ethical and legal to subject convicted criminals to. For two decades, medical researchers led by Dr. Albert Kligman, the renowned inventor of the acne medication Retin-A, used inmates as lab animals. They tested a range of products on them, from facial creams and skin moisturizers to perfumes, detergents, and anti-rash treatments. Other more hazardous chemicals and compounds were tested as well. Radioactive isotopes, poisons like dioxin, and even chemical warfare agents. The testing on inmates became so common at the prison that Kligman recalled thinking upon entering Holmesburg for the first time, all I saw before me were acres of skin. It was like a farmer seeing a fertile field for the first time. Many big-name organizations had a finger in the pie of this controversial research. Doctors received funding from the likes of Johnson & Johnson, Dow Chemical, and the U.S. Army to expose inmates to things like herpes, streptococcus, skin-blistering chemicals, and psychoactive drugs. Although an FDA investigation in 1966 led to a brief ban on Kligman's experiments at the prison, they resumed again less than a month after. It wasn't until 1974 that the prison's board of trustees forced an end to research following a Senate hearing. In 2000, nearly 300 former test subjects filed a class action lawsuit against the prison and the companies involved. After years of paperwork and courtroom drama, a federal court finally ruled that the statute of limitations for the case had passed, and it was dismissed. The 
The Cold War exposed the world to a period of weaponization that has shaped our modern geopolitical world. Technology made the arms race between the Soviet Union and the United States the deadliest in history. Nuclear weapons became the staple of any country that wanted a seat at the table. But the arms race extended beyond the nuclear. It infected the minds of those in power with paranoia. Both sides didn't want the other to gain the upper hand. In the 1950s, this paranoia convinced the CIA that the communist bloc had discovered a method for mind control. Not wanting to be outdone, the spooks set out on their own quest to unlock the secret of controlling the human mind. And thus, Project MKUltra was born. A chemist named Sidney Gottlieb ran this top secret project. For the better part of a decade, funded by the US government, Gottlieb carried out experiments uh, with LSD in American, German, Japanese, and Filipino prisons. According to Stephen Kinzer, a journalist who spent years investigating Project MKUltra, the researchers soon realized achieving mind control was a two step process. First, you had to blast away the existing mind. Second, you had to find a way to insert a new mind into that resulting void. They didn't get too far on number two, but they did a lot of work on number one. One of the more notable prisoners subjected to LSD testing under this project was notorious crime boss Whitey Bulger. Bulger volunteered for a project he was told was researching a cure for schizophrenia. For more than a year following, he was given LSD every day. Oh, and writing about his experiences afterwards, Bulger described the experience as horrific and talks about how he thought he was going insane. Perhaps the most nefarious aspect of Project MKUltra was the research and preparation that went into it. According to Stephen Kinzer, the experiments were essentially a continuation of work that began in Japanese and Nazi concentration camps. The CIA hired Nazi doctors who had been involved in similar experiments during World War II to advise the team and lecture researchers on how long it took for people to die from the poison gas sarin. Since Project MKUltra was top secret, it's hard to measure the human toll the CIA's quest for mind control took. Suffice to say, many lives were either taken or destroyed. Gottlieb abandoned the project in the 1960s with the conclusion that mind control was not possible. He went on to lead other research projects for the government. Wendell Johnson had grown up stuttering from a young age. It rendered his speech indecipherable during bad spouts by the time he attended the University of Iowa. His own experience with a speech impediment pushed him to enroll in the psychology master's program focusing on speech pathology. Stuttering also affected many of his graduate classmates. They were just as driven to understand their affliction and find a cure. Their curiosity soon turned into experiments that towed the line of acceptable. They would use each other as guinea pigs, transcribe their struggles with speech in notebooks mid-conversation, submit each other to electroshock treatment, fire off guns near their ears in the name of studying their stuttering. As his studies progressed and his academic career took him to the role of professor, Wendell Johnson became convinced that stuttering was not a biological feature. He thought it was a learned behavior. This conviction came from his examination of his own life and his development of stuttering. But he knew he needed better proof than just his life story to prove his theory right. He needed an experiment. He enlisted the help of Mary Tudor, one of his clinical psychology graduate students, to carry out the experiment. He instructed her to go to an orphanage in the nearby town of Davenport to see if she could talk children into having a speech impediment. Johnson wanted to know if telling children with no stutter that they were stuttering would make them, in fact, develop a stutter. Mary began with 22 subjects who thought they were going to receive speech therapy. For months, Mary would drive out to the orphanage and talk with each child, careful to follow a script Professor Johnson provided. Speaking with children with no history of speech impediment, she would say, You have many of the symptoms of a child who is beginning to stutter. Do anything to keep from stuttering. Don't ever speak unless you can do it right. She noticed effects immediately. During a second session, Mary wrote the children who had spoken freely during her last visit now practically refused to talk. The children began displaying anxious behaviors. One child held her hand or arm over her eyes for uh, most of the sessions. Another began correcting himself before he even started speaking. All the children's schoolwork worsened. One child refused to take part in it anymore. Another, when Mary asked if her best friend knew of her stuttering, replied that she hardly ever talked to her best friend anymore. After the experiment ended, Mary Tudor and Wendell Johnson provided follow-up care to the affected children. However, the effects of their care, compared with the damage they had already done, was questionable. While speaking with the New York Times years later, the subject who'd stopped speaking to her best friend said she could never tell her husband about her experience in the experiment and that it ruined her life. She could not finish the interview. Three surviving children from the study and the estates of three others who had passed suit the state and the University of Iowa. In 2007, the university agreed on a settlement of just under a million dollars.
Perhaps the most notorious of controversial medical experiments, the research the Nazis carried out in the concentration camps is more than enough to send shivers down your spine. The experiments were part of an organized German national effort to cleanse their society of individuals they deemed a threat to the nation's health. The infamous Dr. Joseph Mengele is the figurehead of much of this work, but Nazi doctors in various concentration camps across German-controlled lands committed atrocities in the name of ensuring military personnel survival, testing medical drugs and treatments, or advancing their government's racial or ideological goals. Militarily, prisoners were used in high-altitude tests to determine the maximum height air crews could parachute safely from, to find effective treatments for hypothermia, and to make seawater drinkable. Nazi scientists tried to push medical advancements by subjecting prisoners to contagious diseases to test possible immunizations or antibodies, using them as subjects for bone-grafting experiments and testing mustard gas and other poisonous compounds on them to find possible antidotes. Mengele himself performed some of the most hair-raising experiments at Auschwitz. His work had a particular focus on twins and often had a racial or ideological focus. Mengele had a keen interest in heterochromia, where a person has eyes of two different colors. He carried out experiments on twins, often children, to test methods to change eye color artificially, test the resilience of different races to various diseases, and document the inferiority of Jewish and Gypsy races through the live dissection and collection of tissue and body part samples. Countless prisoners were tortured and murdered for these experiments. Experts and world leaders later created the Nuremberg Code after World War II to address the atrocities committed by medical professionals and to create a stronger ethical framework to govern future medical experiments. As hard as it is to hear and fathom the horrors carried out by Nazi physicians, they are certainly matched by the atrocities carried out by Japan's Unit 731 during World War II. Similar to the Nazis, a search for an upper hand on the battlefield, cures for diseases, and a racial superiority mindset pushed the members of this infamous unit to subject prisoners to sickening experiments. World War II started in Asia in 1937. From then until the end of the war, Unit 731 of the Japanese Imperial Army, headed by lead physician Shiro Ishii, carried out biological warfare and performed medical tests on civilians, mostly in China. They released plague-infested fleas, dosed wells with cholera and typhoid, and spread anthrax, dysentery, and more in dozens of cities across China to assess their effectiveness in wartime use. They took civilians as prisoners of war and marched them through sub-zero temperatures, then experimented on them to find treatments for frostbite. They subjected others to poisonous gases to develop chemical warfare capabilities and treatments for them on the battlefield. Still others they placed in pressure chambers. The exact casualty rate of the work of Unit 731 is hard to gauge. Estimates range anywhere between a quarter to half a million people. Though the experiment stopped when Japan surrendered to the US, the horrors did not. The US helped the Japanese government cover up the experiments to maintain Japan as an ally against the Soviet Union. It was not until the 1990s that the Japanese government first acknowledged the existence of Unit 731, and not until 2018 that they finally released the names of the members of the unit. Though not dealing with medical experiments per se, these murders raised questions over the ethics of where and how to get cadavers for such research. The early 1800s brought a boom in demand for dead bodies. Medical professionals needed corpses to dissect and experiment in order to stay on the scalpel-thin cutting edge of medical advances. However, the only legally acceptable way of getting your hands on a cold one was to wait for the execution of a condemned murderer. This supply was nowhere near close to meeting demand, so grave robbers answered the call, becoming all but a bona fide profession in the 1800s. Even some medical students and doctors cut out the middleman and dug up the bodies themselves. As with any market, though, constant innovation was required to stay ahead of competitors. William Hadd, the owner of a boarding house in Edinburgh, Scotland, and his friend William Burke concocted a simple way to meet the demand for dead bodies without having to get their hands dirty. From 1827 to 1828, the two Williams killed more than a dozen guests at the boarding house, smothered so as not to lessen the quality of the cadaver and sold them to a local anatomist. When the police caught the two men, they turned Hare into their witness. He turned on his friend Burke and confessed to the murders. Hare's testimony sealed Burke's fate. Burke was hanged and became an executed murderer himself, eligible to be used for medical experiments. The Burke and Hare murder case spurred the UK government to pass the Anatomy Act of 1832, which lessened the restrictions on what bodies medical professionals could use for dissection and experimentation. Red 
James Marion Sims, known as the father of modern gynecology, is revered and reviled at the same time for his work. He is credited with inventing the vaginal speculum, a tool doctors still use today to dilate and examine the vagina, and also with developing a procedure to treat a common complication from childbirth in the 19th century, where the wall between the uterus and the bladder would tear, causing constant pain and leakage. However, the means he used to reach these ends made him the object of much loathing. He performed his experiments on slave women, using no anesthesia and according to historical records, no consent from the women. The debate around Sims's work rages on today. By 1880, he had been named president of both the American Medical Association and the American Gynecological Society. He was praised in cities around the U.S. with the erection of several statues. Though his proponents say he was a man operating under the ethical guidelines of his time, and the women he operated on were likely to be in enough pain to want the treatment even without anesthesia, critics have had their say more recently. They claim there is no way to know if the women wanted the procedures or not, since they were living in the coercive framework of slavery, and their voices were not recorded in historical documents. As scholars on the topic say, consent isn't about whether you could say yes, it's about whether you can say no. One such example, recorded by Sims himself in his record, is of an 18-year-old slave named Lucy. Months after giving birth, she wasn't able to control her bladder. She underwent an hour of surgery, completely naked, positioned on her knees, with her head resting in her hands, screaming in pain for much of the time. As Sims wrote, Lucy's agony was extreme. She later became ill with blood poisoning from Sims's use of a sponge to drain urine from the bladder. According to Sims, I thought she was going to die. It took Lucy two or three months to recover entirely from the effects of the operation. The only consent on record was from her owner, meeting the legal requirement of the time. Many of the statues of Sims have since been taken down. 